Hey there, Duke fans, and welcome to episode 79 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. It has been a while. Um, there have been a couple of lost episodes, uh, but uh, we are back. The team is here. Uh, if you guys don't remember, my name is Donald Blind. I am actually normally from Washington, D.C., but actually calling uh, in from Fort Worth, Texas uh, this morning uh, here on Saturday, July 22nd. Uh, also, my partners in crime are with me. First in Atlanta, we have Jason Evans. Jason, what's going on? Hey, uh, I- I'm I'm glad that we're back, and uh, I want to apologize. Uh, you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned that we'd done a podcast that disappeared. That's that's on me. That's my fault. We, it's, folks, it's, we did one right after the draft. We did one right after the draft, and uh, you know, life sometimes gets a little bit busy. It got and, lost. Uh, it kind of got lost. Yeah. I mean, every episode, every podcast has lost episodes. Maybe one day we will release them and people can say, oh, that's what they were doing. And instead of, we weren't taking just a two month vacation. Well, some of it was vacation, but uh, we, will, we will get into that later. Um, also, partner in crime in Denver, Colorado, Sam Klein, what's going on, dude? Hey, um, on that same topic, uh, shout out to my cousin, Eric, who is not a Duke fan, I don't think, um, but he does listen to the show um, because he's a big basketball fan. Um, and he asked me, right after the draft if we had uh, a breakdown of the Duke guys in the NBA. And I didn't respond to him because we hadn't posted it yet. So, um, Eric, here is my response to your tweet like a month later. Um, Sorry, we didn't do a draft episode. (laughs) Way to disappoint the people. Yeah, I know. And be late doing it. I'm going to have to make it up to him somehow. (laughs) Well, we'll talk about those guys uh, later. First of all, let's jump into this. Marvin Bagley situation. Uh, Marvin Bagley is, uh, by all accounts, the number one rated uh, rook, uh, recruit in next year's recruiting class. But there is now talk, uh, very, very uh, growing talk, that he will be reclassifying as a senior now and joining a college team uh, for this fall. And that one of those teams would be Duke. Um, this would be a really big get. He's six eleven. He's a stretch four. He's really, really good. And uh, would probably make our recruiting class uh, number one in the country uh, by a long shot if he were to reclassify and sign with Duke. Let's start with that. Jason, give me your thoughts on Marvin Bagley. And, and hold on, hold on. Before Jason goes, we need, to issue, we need to issue a blanket statement about the conversation that is about to follow, which is that um, we argued about this yesterday in our group text that we used to plan the podcast. And right before we got into it, uh, mostly me and Jason, I said, uh, we should save this argument for the podcast. So if this argument feels more scripted than what we normally do, um, it's because we've already had this argument uh, yesterday. That is correct. And so, just, well, so with that, wait, wait, Jason. Wait. Jason, kick it off, bud. <laughs> so uh, just so we're clear, I am not looking on my phone. I'm not trying to recreate the conversation that we had yesterday, which, to be fair, wasn't really about Bagley as much as it was about one and done. And, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the, the debate, uh, uh, anyone who reads the DBR, there, has, there is a growing, growing debate in the recruiting th- threads about one and done and about, you know, Duke's participation in it. And I, I don't think there's no one out there who's saying, I don't want us to ever take a one and done player. I mean that that well, era people, is. I think those people have have quit college basketball fandom altogether. Yeah, yeah. Um, but 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 the debate sort of was, uh, does taking someone like Bagley, who's clearly one and done because this guy is so good, uh, and and just so people have perspective, there are uh, NBA scouts. There are people who follow the NBA who say that even though Marvin Bagley is currently you know, in between his junior and senior year of high school, um, he's trying to reclassify so that he would have already been a senior and he'd be ready to go to college, uh, which would put him in the class of 2017. He's currently 2018. He He's trying to get supposedly into the class of 2017. There are NBA scouts who say that had he been available for the most recent NBA draft, which was mostly full of class of 2016 players, like Jason Tatum and Markel Fultz and Harry Giles and so on and so on, um, that if he'd been available for the twenty for the class of 2016, the 2017 NBA draft, that he might have gone number one in that draft. So 
let's be clear about the caliber of player that we're talking about. So the debate was if you take him at this late stage, because, you know, here we are, we're a week away from August. You know, Duke, the Duke basketball team is preparing to go to the Dominican Republic on a preseason tour. Um, you know, official practices haven't even begun yet. Uh, but it, but it is incredibly late, incredibly late to be taking a new recruit. If you take him at this stage, is it something disingenuous to a current to some of the current Duke players who thought they knew the roster when they decided not to transfer or when they came to Duke? Um, you know, are you doing something wrong? And and the people that uh, get talked about the most are are Marcus Bolden, Vra- uh, Antonio Vrankovic, and especially uh, Javin Delorier. Uh, because the the perception is that if we add Bagley, um, it will cut. Uh, it probably cuts a, a bit into Bolden's minutes. Uh, Bolden was looking at being a starter for Duke, and and it's possible that he wouldn't be a starter if Bagley arrived. I mean, Bagley's going to start, and and it would seem that either Wendell Carter or um, Marcus Bolden will will not start as a result. But 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 you know, as the third big man, you're still probably going to get pretty serious minutes. But uh, the guy that most people talk about is um, Delarier who was looking at being the third big man, um, you know, probably a minimum of 20 minutes a game. And if Bagley comes, uh, you know, most people seem to think that his minutes probably go down to five, maybe even 10, and and maybe not playing in in competitive games because Coach K is not known to go four deep, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, with big men. Um, So that's what the... Yeah, I'm rambling here. That's what the debate sort of came out of. And there are a lot of people who say it's better for Duke to develop uh, these guys on the bench, these guys who will maybe be here for three or four years. I mean, Delorier certainly looks like a four-year player, although he's incredibly athletic, um, which usually would be a guy who might leave a little bit early. But uh, just from a skill standpoint, um, it, you know, it looks like it may take him a little bit longer. So uh, is it better for Duke to make sure we develop Delorier a little bit to to – to prevent him from transferring um, so he feels like he's getting chances at Duke? Um, uh, or do you take Marvin Bagley and potentially risk Delorier leaving the same way uh, Shemi Ojale did, the same way Michael Benajay did, um, the same way Chase Jeter did? So that was the genesis of the debate. I haven't gotten into the debate. I haven't gotten into what my feelings on it are, although I think most people know that I'm of the belief that you recruit the best players you can who fit into your system. You know, obviously, I'm not going to say that Duke should go out and get guys who aren't committed to school at all. Uh, Coach K talks about unpacking your bags. Um, he makes sure that the guys he brings in are part of the Duke community. They understand what it means to be at Duke University. They attend class. Even if they know they're only going to be there, if they're pretty sure they're only going to be there for one year, they're still invested in being a part of the Duke program and the Duke community. So I'm not saying we go away from that. Uh, and and by the way, by all accounts, uh, one of the reasons Marvin Bagley is able to reclassify is because he does really well in the classroom. Um, that's one of the reasons he's going to he's going to try to graduate from high school early. Um, I mean, so to be clear, we're not talking about a guy who has no interest whatsoever in academics. Uh, so I I think that once we have that standard, that that we're going to get guys who who will unpack their bags and who will be a part of Duke. That if it's a really good player. You go after them. Um, they're not a ton of those guys, so there's a limit on the number of guys that Duke can go after. Uh, and I also firmly think, if you look at Duke's history, Coach K finds a way to play guys who are ready to play. And there are a lot of people who go, oh, Javin Delorier barely, you know, he played like 70 or 80 minutes, something like that last year. He, he didn't get to play very much. Well, the answer is, if you looked at him on the floor, he wasn't ready to play yet. Uh, even though he was highly athletic, he just he just wasn't able to to perform, and and that's the reason that he didn't get lots of playing time. And I believe that if he's ready to perform this year, if he's improved and worked on his game in the off season and and developed more of the skills, and he's not quite as hyperkinetic, uh, that that Coach K will find a way to play him. And I challenge folks, name me someone who we could tell was ready to perform ready to play at a high level for Duke, who Coach K didn't find ways to put into the game. And when, when people start citing Shemi Ojale and Michael Benajay and Chase Jeter, I say, when you look at how they did when they played games for Duke, don't look at how they did a couple of years later after they transferred. When you look at how they did when they were playing for Duke, 
I don't blame Coach K for not playing them as much as he did. Would I have liked for them to get maybe a little more time, maybe develop a little more? Yeah, but but it's not like we watched these guys and went, oh, wow, that guy is absolutely ready to contribute right away. And I'll give yeah, you some other I, Go, go ahead, that, go, so, jump in. Jason, I, I think that there's, a, there's something a little bit disingenuous about that argument because we don't know. I mean, if we only see them in, in very limited minutes, um, it's kind of hard to judge because we're looking at a small sample. You know, talk about um, Grayson Allen early in his freshman season, or even even into ACC season. Um, Elliot Williams well, wait, so, so, but, back hold, in 2011 hold on, hold on. before he before he before he became a starter and before he got serious minutes. Um, I think Elliot Williams is a great example of that. Even if and and maybe it took him time to get there, um, but but the the limited minutes is a is a hard thing to judge and. Um, and and honestly, with Delorier, we just might not know. Um, so, sorry, you were you were you were going to jump in there. Go so, ahead. So I was going to say, I actually think that Grayson Allen and Elliot Williams are are excellent counterpoints. They are proof of what I'm talking about because in both cases, um, I think as fans we saw glimpses early on, and then Coach K also saw those glimpses and gave them time. If you look at Elliot Williams, once he started getting, he, he started to perform and he got more and more time. It's not like he played really well and Coach K continued to keep him on the bench. Same with Grayson Allen. He didn't play a lot early in the year. He played a, a bit and, and, and he wasn't I mean, as good early in the Allen year did, as. Allen really didn't play much at all during, during the regular season. There were a couple games where he got a lot of minutes, but it wasn't, it wasn't like there was a point, you know, if you. You know, we have, we talk about the Zubek in 2010 thing all the time as proof that like you know you can be one kind of player and then all of a sudden your minutes can go up and you can become a different player. Allen didn't really get consistent minutes throughout the end of the season that year. He he had a couple games where he played a lot and contributed a lot, but for the most part, didn't didn't have that opportunity. Uh, so I disagree. Um, I am okay. looking at Grayson Allen's game log. All right, and tell, tell it to me. So so. Uh, Grayson Allen started to show real signs uh, in in early mid February that that he could be a contributor. Um, it, before that, he wasn't he wasn't doing much at all. I mean, like, I'll give you a great example. So we played Notre Dame. I'm looking at the game log. We played yeah, Notre Dame. On the, that was one of the two February. big games he had during the regular season. It was that and Wake Forest, no, no, right? No, actually, it wasn't. I was going to say. So he played 16 minutes against Notre Dame. We blew Notre Dame out. He he had he had five points. He didn't really do much of anything. Um, okay. Uh, and then the, the game where he started to play well was on February. So that's 16 minutes. I mean, he got some time. He got 11 minutes against UVA a couple of games before that. He only scored one point. He got 11 minutes against Florida State. He only scored two points. Um, so then uh, in late February, we play Clemson. He gets 18 minutes and he scores 10 points. Um, and, and a couple games later, we play Wake Forest. And that's the game where he exploded. He got 27 points. Remember, he had like he had he probably had twenty seven points at halftime against Wake Forest. It was he, like he a, it was a crazy man. blowout. Yeah, yes, it was a blowout. But he was beating. Remember, he was beating Wake Forest at halftime. Didn't he have like twenty points at halftime? And yeah, Wake something, didn't even have something crazy like that. Yeah, so that's March fourth. After that, he's playing double digit minutes virtually every game after that. And I'm talking NCAA tournament, you know, against San Diego State, against Utah, close game against Utah. He plays nine minutes. I mean, he was he was. After that Wake Forest game, after he showed in a game, after he showed that he was capable of helping this team out, Coach K starts playing him. And 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 when we get to the Final Four, he's playing almost twenty minutes a game. Right, but I that, actually think that, that's Allen, also... to some extent he's proof. He's you know he wasn't performing early in the year. Look at his stats. Look at the games. Look at what happened early in the season. I think that may also be a reflection. It may also be a reflection on that team and the, the uh, kind of how Matt Jones faded a little bit, um, and that, and especially in the final four, there was foul trouble that that sort of forced Allen into the game. I mean, he, you know, in that in that championship game that we all remember, Allen's biggest contribution was was saving the team when when oh. multiple guys were in foul trouble in the second half, and he kind of had the opportunity to took to take over, if. If there's no foul trouble, how many minutes does Grayson Allen get in that championship game? I mean, I mean we'll he, never know. Yeah, but I mean, a, he he was part that, of the rotation. I, I feel like he was playing some. He was part of the rotation some. A little bit. Um, I, I'm so so. 
I guess my general point is it, it's kind of hard to argue against you in the case it, to to find a player who didn't play even though he was ready because if he's on the bench and we don't know he's ready, uh, and if he's on the bench, we don't know he's ready. If he's playing, um, then he is ready. So there's the, you know, it, 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 it can kind of only work in one direction. Um, and then but, sometimes these guys get opportunities because of injury or, or like you said, foul trouble and stuff like that. Sure. It's not like I, so wait, all of so a sudden, so it's not like, it's not like we're, we're, you know, Shane Battier where coach K said, okay, kid, you're ready. And threw him out there against Maryland, and he goes I, off. I think that the I think that the thing you want to that I want to go back to, and and Jason, you already noted that it is a little bit unfair to talk about, let's say Mike Benaje, um, who what didn't really play much at all his freshman year, the limited minutes he got, like you said, weren't great. But Benaje developed into an All ACC type player, um, and and performed really well at Syracuse pretty soon after after he arrived there, uh, even though he had to wait out the the one season for the transfer. I think what's tough about this whole situation is that you recruit guys like Delorier, um, and and maybe Bolden ends up falling into this category. I think we may have we may have overstated Bolden's potential when he came in, or maybe you know things have just changed for him. Um, but guys like that, sort of the four star, maybe low five star guys who are potentially fringe NBA prospects. Um, you need guys like that on the team to to be able to stick around and provide continuity. I think the challenge for Duke the last couple of years has been lacking more of those un, those upperclassmen, and there is, I think there may be something missing in the development of those guys. If you have so many one and dones, I'm not saying that Duke shouldn't be getting one and dones, um, but it's especially highlighted in this instance with Bagley, where the team's all set. They, I think, they actually did have. A practice this week because they put out a, a video about it. Yeah, they did yesterday. Uh, Their first practice was yesterday. Because they're because they're because they're going to the Dominican Republic soon for that trip. So um, at this point, all the guys sort of know kind of what they don't know exactly what their roles will be. They're still sort of fighting out, you know, who's who's going to get minutes. But at least they know who the competition is. And and for the guys like Delorier and Bolden, the opportunities at Duke really change. Uh, you know, each year may mean a lot to them. And the opportunities change if a guy like Bagley comes in last minute. Um, you know, th- there was talk that Bolden was thinking about declaring for the NBA draft. Would Bolden declare for the NBA draft if Bagley was there? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I, I just, I, I at least acknowledge that this situation is different than the previous ones. It's a little bit different than Mo Bamba because it's a month later. Um, it's it, it just, just in all of that put together. I would also note... Um, speaking of the DR trip, I was reading um, Steve Wiseman's article from the Herald Sun about Bagley uh, out of this morning or yesterday. Um, but he notes that uh, Duke is taking the foreign tour to, to the DR next month, and to participate, players need to be enrolled in the second summer session. That means that even if Bagley picks Duke, he wouldn't be able to accompany the team on that trip. Um, uh, no, it, it's, there, there's there's a belief that that's wrong. There's a belief that Steve Wiseman okay. is wrong about it. so that, uh, NBA rules yeah, actually say you, you if you are you know enrolled to participate in the next semester that you can take the, like if he's enrolled for the fall yeah um then he could take the the trip that you but don't have to be to, enrolled in summer school but he has to he has to get cleared before that's before that's the case right uh, oh yeah not, yeah there's no question be... about that he he would have to he has to pick duke he has to commit to duke uh, Duke has to go through some sort of formal admission process, although we know that they are able to expedite these things for basketball players. Um, and, and, and he has to get enrolled um, for the, so for the fall semester. And he, there's a lot of steps. he'd be able to participate in that trip. There are a lot of steps yeah. left well, before I, I, he's able to go on that trip, and, and time is running out. Um, I mean, I, yes, I, I don't... Yes. The, 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 whole, the, the other the, thing the, about this, and this kind of leads to, this kind of leads to what, what else makes me sort of uncomfortable about this whole thing, is that it's July 22nd. The fall semester starts in a month. Um, what, like, how much can, can this kid possibly be doing academically to, like, change his NCAA clearinghouse situation in, in one month? Uh, I know that it's been, it's been talked about for a while, but if he's not ready yet, and if he's playing on all the summer basketball circuits, it just seems, it just seems like there isn't time to, to be doing all of these important steps all at once. Um, 
I'm, I'm not saying that I think that, that there's something, you know, there's that there's something foul about this. Uh, I'm just saying it seems it, it seems challenging to me, um, and that and that if this was the path you wanted to take, um, in the way that Derek Thornton did or that Andre Dawkins did, those guys, you know, it, they announced their intentions earlier and and had a little bit more time to like figure everything out. I don't know, and 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 maybe I'm off base because because it sounds like they've been discussing this for a while, and he's obviously very talented and and. I had seen the same stuff that Jason saw about how, you know, he was so good that he could have been number one in this most recent draft. Um, so maybe it's been part of it all along. It just seems like maybe we're getting the news now at a, like a lot faster and, and a lot more, we're hearing about it a lot more. Um, so, so part of that makes, honestly makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Was the, was the Derek Thornton, I, I'm trying to remember this, was the Derek Thornton reclassification, was it this late or was it earlier in the summer? It was way earlier in the summer. It was like in it was like April May time frame. He okay. He, yeah, um, I remember there wasn't anything like. I mean, I think the pressure of the fact that you know we're going to the Dominican Republic is also feeding into this a little bit because again, right. you have those questions of will this will Bagley reclassify in time to go? Will he be even be eligible and all this stuff? So I think that's kind of where it's fueling the whole you know the uncomfortableness that you were just describing uh, because it's almost like we're trying to make room for one last player before we go on this trip. Um, and then, I mean, if, if there was this trip, would it, would it be this big of a, a hot topic? Because the guys, as you said, would not be practicing. So I and, think and, that and it wouldn't be feeding into it a little bit. And the DR trip isn't a big deal, like in the grand scheme for Bagley or for um, the draft or, or recruiting. Um, it just really matters to this team right now. Correct. Um, and, and it's certainly on Coach K's mind and probably on the players' minds. Uh, as they're getting ready for that trip. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I think we've talked about this enough. Anything else before we move on? I mean, Jason was the one that 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 I think really had the the interesting points about, um, or you raised the good question, which is how is this really different than any of the other situations? Um, and uh, yeah, and, and 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 I agree with you in the sense that I want Duke to have good players. Um, you know, sort of with the general caveat that I want them to be academically eligible and yada, yada, yada. Um, uh, it just seems like it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more than it was, you know, for, for the, I get, don't call it the worst, um, but, but the most extreme previous example. And ultimately, do, you know, ask me, do I, do I want Marvin Bagley on to, to play at Duke? Yep. Whenever he wants. Uh, if, if Marvin Bagley wants to play at Duke, he's going to be a great player. It sounds like. I haven't, I haven't like broken down his game tape or anything. I don't think that's my expertise. Um, but it sounds like he's going to be an instant contributor for the for the squad, and it would be awesome if he's around. Um, at the same time, acknowledging that that the whole situation um, is is somewhat uncomfortable, and that I hope that it, especially as you as you look forward at, at recruiting for future years, uh, it seems like it makes it easier for other programs to recruit against Duke, uh, particularly for the guys in the, you know, 15 to 30 range of the recruiting rankings, because, hey, look, Javin Delorier was a, you know, four borderline five star kid, like a four star kid. And um, he couldn't he couldn't get playing time. And uh, and Marquise Bolden was a five star kid. and He couldn't get playing time. Um, you know, that that I think yeah, eventually I'm comes back there, to hurt you. There there are school uh, there are. The top programs have players like that all the time. I mean, I, I haven't I haven't done all the start spouting off the names. Sure. But there are plenty of guys who are big time recruits who don't get who don't get time, um, uh, you know, until later in their career, or who are for, forced to transfer or something like that. It it happens at every program in the country. Uh, anyone who tried to use that against Duke. Duke's going to be able to turn around and use it against the other school. And, and what's more, um, the last thing you want to be saying to a kid when you're recruiting him, uh, if you're a rival school, is, you know what, you're not going to be good enough to play at Duke. Um, d most kids are so confident in their abilities, and, and so much of, uh, of the recruiting process is telling them about um, how good they are to, to then turn around and say, oh, but you're, you're not going to be able to play at Duke. It just, you know, when you're talking about a, a top 30, a top 40 player, 
the kid's just going to be like, what are you talking about? And Duke's going to be able to say, hey, look at Luke Kennard. Luke Kennard wasn't a top 10 recruit, and he got instant playing time at Duke, and he developed into a better and better player, and he was a lottery pick. Look at Matt Jones. Matt Jones was ranked in the mid-30s. He's ranked very similar to Javin Delorier. And Matt Jones was able to develop his game and turn into something that was very, very useful to Duke. And he played a significant role on a national championship team. And he played a significant role throughout his college career. Um, And who knows what Matt Jones' professional career will will end up being. I mean, mean, he's probably not playing playing in the We can make these arguments on both. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, no, I agree. Matt Jones is probably not playing in the NBA. But... But I'm saying if you're talking about talking to a top 30 kid and saying to him, oh, look, Javin Delorier didn't develop at Duke, assuming he doesn't. Look, we don't know. The kid's only been here for one year. But if, if you make that argument to, the, to, to a kid from a recruiting standpoint, if I'm Duke, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to name all the guys who were, who were t- you know, only top 30, only top 40, who turned into really got nice players at Duke, some of whom are in the NBA. Jason, um, Jason you're missing Marshall Plumley. Exactly. Bingo. Miles, um, people forget Miles Plumley, who's being paid like $16 million a year by the Atlanta Hawks right now. Miles Plumley was like barely a top 100 recruit. Remember? I mean, Miles Plumley was like a top, was like in the he top was, 70 or 80. He, he, he was sort of like, he was, uh, he was sort of insurance for making sure that we got Mason Plumley. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, actually, Mason had already committed. Right. And, and, <clears throat> and Miles, Miles, you know, Miles was going to have his uh, uh, Stanford. Yeah. Right, he was originally going to go to and Stanford, then and, and then he, yeah, yeah, so it was the whole coaching change there. They brought in Johnny Dawkins, and, and he went, I don't want to work for that dookie, I want to work for the other dookie. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think, I don't think any of this stuff becomes legitimate or fertile negative recruiting ground against Duke. I just, Duke's, too, Duke's recruiting is too good for anyone to say to me, oh, wait, Duke's suddenly going to, I, I mean, <laughs> Duke just got was Jordan Tucker, just a you know a couple months ago. We got him very very late in the process. And, he is almost like a throwing. Yeah, I mean, and this guy's this guy's a top forty, top fifty recruit who had sat there and watched Javon Delorier's entire season. <laughs> I mean, how could you how can you make that argument that that this is going to negatively impact recruiting when all the evidence is that's not the case? I, I don't see it. I don't see it at all. And I continue to say my biggest argument is guys who show they can play end up playing for Duke. Guys who really struggle maybe don't get time and they decide they need to go someplace else. And sometimes when they go that someplace else, uh, they, they, they learn what they hadn't learned at Duke. Um, and, and the process of leaving Duke is what teaches them that lesson. That's what, uh, if you talk about, uh, you know, Shemi Ojale, who, who's on the Boston Celtics now, um, who, who was at Duke a couple of years ago and then transferred to SMU um, and had a great single year, only one year at SMU, and then went into the, to the draft. He openly says that when he was at Duke, he wasn't ready to be a contributor yet. He wasn't ready to play the way he learned to play at SMU. And he said that the process of leaving Duke caused him to look at wh- where he was as a player and, and the kind of commitment he needed to make to his game. And I think that's the case with a lot of these other guys. And, and you know, Sam, you mentioned Michael Benajay, because I know we want to move on. Um, and you talk about, oh, he was at Duke and he didn't get to play at all. And then he went to Syracuse and he was a star at Syracuse. His first year at Syracuse, I looked up the stats. Michael Benajay's first year at Syracuse, he, he averaged 3.4 points per game. Three and a half points a game his first year at Syracuse. He was not an instant star there. He was not ready to play when he was at Duke. He transferred. He wasn't ready to play right away at Syracuse, even though that was, you know, it was a full year after he left Duke. And then it wasn't until the following season, which is like two or three years later because he had to sit out a year for transfer, that he began to become a really good player at Syracuse. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm telling you guys, if Javin Delorier has developed, if Marcus Bolden has de- have developed, they will get playing time this year, whether Marvin Bagley is at Duke or not. And by so, the way, I think it's, it's still pretty likely Marvin Bagley won't be at Duke. So, so this according, be... according, according to Jason Evans, the sky is not falling. Don't worry. Duke will continue to get better. Yes, and more importantly, the, the, these, these players, you won't... I'm telling you, 
someone find an example for me of someone that clearly showed they were good enough to play that Coach K wasn't playing. He plays them. If they're good enough, he plays them. Donalds, have we beaten it to death? I think we can leave it right there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that anyone, I, the, people have tuned out in droves. <laughs> we have been talking for 30 minutes about stuff that no one cares about, I think. No, th- this, is, this is what people care about. <laughs> this, is what people care. this is what people this is ask Duke us basketball. to do. It's, it's Duke Basketball Report. We're not, the, we're not the New York Times. That's right. All right, let's move on to uh, recent NBA alumni. Um, you know, we, we talked about the draft, and, you know, we had four guys that were drafted. We have a lot of guys that have moved to new situations. I want to get into all that in just a second. I want to start with the big news from yesterday that basically broke Twitter. Um, Le- LeBron James I and mean, Kyrie Irving uh, apparently are splitting up because Kyrie Irving wants to trade from the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, before we get into this conversation, I'd like to start off by offering, uh, offering the Cavaliers Reggie Jackson straight up for Kyrie Irving. It will fit under the trade machine. I already checked it out. It works. Everyone would be happy. And I would be happy because I'd have two Dukies on my team. Uh, hi, Luke Kennard. Uh, so I, this, is a, this is the major news that really just destroyed the, the internet yesterday. Let's start with that, and then we can jump into some of the Summer League stuff and some of the other uh, movement of NBA uh, uh, Duke, or Duke alumni. So let's start with you, Sam. Your thoughts on the Kyrie breakup with the Cavaliers or the, or the rumored one. It, it's, it's crazy in the NBA how quickly things can, like your fortunes can change for any organization. The Cavs have been to the finals the last, what, three years? Yep. Um, and uh, have been, you know, the second best team in the league for, for three years. Now, they're chasing a team that at this point is a total juggernaut, uh, and no one's going to be able to beat the Warriors. But, um, you know, like the, the, the team that has LeBron is... It all of a sudden is in is in total turmoil, and it seems like from everything you read, you can't blame Kyrie for wanting to go somewhere else. Um, you know, I, I think he he recognizes that this is the best it's going to get in Cleveland. Um, if he thinks he's getting better, and if he thinks he's going to be able to lead a team that's a top team, um, then yeah, he he probably needs to move on somewhere else. It also sounds like LeBron James wants to move on, so the the situation that's in the Cleveland may. Yeah, it may, go, it may go back to, to being right. It, it it may be, you know, the Cavs going back to what they were pre Kyrie, post LeBron. Um, so, which is bad, which is the situation that landed them so many top draft picks all in a row. Um, and and the organization has has basically proved time and again that outside of having LeBron James and outside of drafting Kyrie Irving, um, they're not really good at at finding the other players and, and building a team uh, around those stars, um, LeBron sort of does that for them. And if he doesn't want to be there, they're not going to be very good. They, I, did, they, did they hire a GM yet? I know they were, they were GM-less for a while. I don't um, think they have because they were looking at Chauncey Billups, and Chauncey Billups uh, grew some wisdom and was like, yeah. nah, I don't want to be a part of the situation. It's, it's so delicate there because, you know, yeah, LeBron is basically de facto GM, but also the actual GM was doing a really good job of bringing in some of these small pieces, like you said, that was filling out this puzzle uh, around the big, on, the big hang three. On. Hang on. Here, here, here's the deal with the Cleveland GM thing. First of all, Chauncey was willing to do it. He was perfectly happy to do it. They made him a low ball offer. Right. And and Chauncey, said, nah. uh, Chauncey was like, uh, you know, you got to pay me sort of the going rate to be a GM. And they wouldn't, they were not willing to do that. And so Chauncey said, forget it. The ca- it's, it sort of just came out in the past. Um, day Which or is, so. I mean, that, isn't that isn't that a little bit? I, and not that it's not that it's wrong of Chauncey to think that he should be getting whatever the standard market is for a GM. But I don't. What is his? How much like basketball development and and team building has he gotten to do since he retired? Right. I mean, but there's also the fact that there's also the fact that Dan Gilbert has never re-signed a GM ever as an owner. They've always had one contract and something happens and, and Dan Gilbert gets this like thing where he's like, I need to bring in someone else and they fire him or they let him go or, or something like that. So I think that's thing, also the, the, the NBA knows this and, and a lot of these players and a lot of these execs, they're not willing to work with a guy who they know is going to 
throw them to the curb after a couple of years because that's what's been happening every single time. Um, so uh, Kobe Altman is this guy who'd been serving as the Cavs interim general manager. I think he was like the assistant GM and now he's like the uh, he's the interim general manager. And, and supposedly in the past day, it came out that Kobe Altman is going to be the full time general manager. That they're going to make him full time GM. The thing I don't get, by the way, about the Cavs situation is with with Chauncey Billups and, and not that this is a Duke thing. We should probably drop it as fast as we can. Um uh, Gilbert's already paying one of the highest payrolls in the NBA. Uh, the extra million or two million that it would have taken to to make Chauncey Billups happy is like nothing to him. It, it, it's it's money that it does not matter at all when you look at the overall structure of of Cleveland's you know payroll, not just to players but to the front office. It, it's just not very much money. I don't understand. Uh, Gilbert is such a he's so bad. He's just he's just a terrible owner. Um, watch what you watch what you say about Dan Gilbert around around people who are proud of Detroit. He does own half of Detroit. <laughs> what? I, he's he's a horrible NBA owner. No, I'm um, I'm, I'm I'm with you, Jason. Yeah, I am too. Yeah, I mean he's the king of Comic Sans. Uh, uh, so, I think regarding Kyrie, let's get back on topic. I don't blame Kyrie at all for deciding to move on. Um, I I, I think he's. I think it's a really smart move on his part. He doesn't want to be stuck with the remnants of of what LeBron James leaves behind. Um, you know, all this you know for all this summer, people have been talking about how Cleveland's not making the moves they need to make, and and LeBron's getting more and more frustrated, and and it's pretty much considered a foregone conclusion at this point that LeBron is probably going to leave when his contract is up next year. Um, and Kyrie's like, well, well, wait a second, I don't want to be left holding the bag when you leave. Um. I don't blame Kyrie for for thinking that way. Uh, if I was Kyrie, I'd probably be thinking the same thing. There's there's just you know it doesn't make any sense for him to just stick around and and watch LeBron burn Cleveland to the ground, which is which is what is going to happen, by the way. Um, and the reason Cleveland's in such bad shape is because LeBron's always playing GM, and he want he's like, oh, you need to bring in my friends. Oh, you need to pay these these guys who are my buddies. You need to pay them what what um what they're demanding and so cleveland's playing way too much money to tristan thompson and they're paying way too much money to to other guys J.R. smith because lebron you know desperately wanted these guys to be part of part of his team um and and uh, you know i don't that that's why it, cleveland's capped out cleveland can't do anything with the cap um they can't make any moves and a lot of it is lebron's fault um, and LeBron set up a situation where, because he had player options on his contracts, he set up a situation where every year he sort of, you know, or every other year, he gets to choose whether or not he sticks around. And so Kyrie's like, well, now that it looks like you're not sticking around, I'm not going to stick around either. So Kyrie wasn't going to let himself be held hostage by LeBron James. Hey, props to Kyrie. Yeah. Um, and I Also, think, can, I, we, can we talk about, like, this, what really makes this a, a like a a mind boggling like thing and how it's going to shape the NBA. Just think about all the players who have tra- who have been traded or signed away from the Eastern conference. Who's going to win the Eastern conference next year. Yeah. It's probably still going to be Cleveland, Boston, Boston. But, but like the Pistons have done v- barely anything in the off season. And they're probably now in the top, th- top five in the Eastern conference, just because everyone else has left. It seems the Washington wizards have done literally nothing in the offseason, and they're probably a top three team now. Hey, the Wizards, the Wizards just signed John Wall to another extension. Oh, he actually agreed to it. Yeah, 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 that, that just happened. Well, there you Recently. go. That's, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a massive contract. He's making yeah. huge it's like bank. $170 million or something like that? Get yeah. your money, John Wall. There you go. Do the John Wall. But like, yeah, I, I, I think that's what really is the key here, because one of the, the rumored uh, suitors for, for Kyrie is the San Antonio Spurs. The shift to the West is just going to be incredible if that is pulled off. There's, I think the Knicks and the Heat were also two other teams that were um, on the list, on, on his list. But if everyone's moving out of the East into the West, like, honestly, like, the NBA should just cancel the Eastern Conference next year. Just give it to LeBron. He'll be in the finals. And then Boston. we can just have NBA live. But, uh, Hello? Am I- Boston, Boston just lost Avery Bradley. There's their best defender. Boston's a lot better than they were last year. 
I mean, they have, they have Jason Tatum, and we can. We got. We can I was gonna say that. we got to talk about Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum was as impressive as any rookie in NBA summer league. I agree with that. He was lighting up summer league. But I think in the end of the day, when you talk about just star power, like people aren't gonna watch those games. Like it's gonna honestly, like, and I love this team. It's like the 2004 Pistons. No one wanted to watch us. I love that team because that team was just all defense and just gritty and, and like didn't have any quote unquote star power. It was just a team. The, the Eastern Conference is not going to have, I mean, when in a league built around stars, almost every single one of the stars are in the Western Conference. You have a couple, like you have John Wall, you have LeBron, you have uh, the Greek freak in, in, um, in Milwaukee, Milwaukee, and then you have IT in Boston. That's really it. Like most of the other guys have left for the for the Western Conference, and and that Gordon is Hayward. <laughs> Gordon Hayward came east. <laughs> I don't think that Gordon Hayward Gordon counts Hayward's as a star. Not this, it's not on this list. <laughs> We're not going to put him on this list. Like he's a good hey, player. <laughs> I, I want to point out. I want to point out something about the Kyrie situation that I think is really interesting. That um, I think people are are ignoring because there there are people who are saying Kyrie's selfish and um, you know that he's not a team player and all this other kind of stuff because he wants to leave and and he said. One of the reasons he wants to leave is he's sort of sick of being in LeBron's shadow all the time. Um, if Ky- by by demanding a trade, if Kyrie gets traded, um, he he hurts himself from a financial standpoint. He loses uh, you mentioned Larry John. Yeah, you mentioned John Wall in the supermax. Um, Kyrie would be eligible in two years for a supermax extension, which is the you know this is the biggest contract the NBA is able to give you, and um, uh, if he gets traded. The nature of the NBA rules are he would not be eligible for that supermax extension. Yeah, but, but if you get but traded, he's, a, he, he's he's still going to make plenty of money and and has his own shoes. So, um, I'm, yeah, but it's the difference. It's the difference in making like thirty thirty two million a year and making thirty seven thirty eight million a year or something like I, I, something like that. It, it'll depend on the cap and other things. It's certainly, but Kyrie has been. Me, go ahead. It's hard for me to fathom that kind of money, but yeah, uh, I'd rather still giving it, up like five million a year. Yeah. yeah, but at the at the point where I'm making thirty million dollars a year, I would like to be million. in in the best situation possible. Kyrie I, is the I, is I the best team player because he's willingly stayed in Cleveland. When there was no LeBron, he was in Cleveland. When LeBron came back, he was in Cleveland. And now that he wants to leave, he's all of a sudden a selfish player. No, he willingly stayed in Cleveland for like seven years. The only the guys, that, but but he didn't have a choice. The only <laughs> guys in the NBA who aren't selfish are the ones who are in good situations. Amen. That, that, that is Absolutely. well stated. You know, oh, Steph Curry. Steph Curry is a team player. Yeah, because he because he signed a cheap extension when when everyone thought that his ankles were never going to heal, and um, and he was like, yeah, you know what? I can I may be able to ride this contract out, and then I won't be able to walk again, but I'll have fifty million dollars. Oh, Steph Curry is a team player. Well, now he's on a now he's he's healthy, and now he's on an unstoppable team. Duh. And now he has um, two hundred million dollars. Yeah, yeah. So so it's you know it's I. I I think that that all that loyalty in the NBA is overrated. All these guys are playing ultimately for the same organization. They play for the NBA. Um, most of their money comes from their individual shoe contracts or from for or from NBA, you know, like TV money. The, the teams don't individually rake in the the revenue to be paying guys thirty or forty million dollars. Um, the league takes care of that by by selling their TV rights. So I, I, I don't know. Um, all that stuff seems like bunk to me, and and we can root for Kyrie because he's because he's a Duke guy, and if he thinks that that he's going to find a better situation by going off and getting traded, um, and that you know that might backfire on him because who knows what where the Cavs are going to send him to if they send right. him anywhere. He does not have a no trade clause, like he um, can't dictate where he goes. You know, th- this is him kind of going out on a limb and and trying to find a better situation for himself so that he can you know win championships, more championships. Um, I don't, I don't begrudge him that I don't begrudge any of the players that, that want to go, you know, like, look at, look at Carmelo Anthony years ago, he was on the Denver Nuggets. They were a, I wouldn't say they were ever a favorite, you know, they, they were playing behind Kobe's Lakers in the West all those years, but Carmelo Anthony was like, I don't, I don't like being on, you know, a perennial second round, maybe Western conference final Nuggets team. Um, I want to be somewhere else. I want to be in New York and he gets traded and it's been a total mess for him in New York that whole time. Um, and, and it, something like that could happen to Kyrie. And, and I'm sure that somebody has mentioned that to him because like, look at how miserable the whole Carmelo Anthony thing has been. It doesn't always work out for these players when they, when they go to new teams and get traded, um, even if they are stars on the level of a Kyrie Irving or a Carmelo Anthony. 
So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, we by, were, by the way, one more thing. About, go ahead. I was going to say one more thing about Kyrie really quick. Um, so, uh, you know, I mentioned he can't dictate where he goes um, uh, because he does not have a no trade clause. But the, the, four, the four teams he mentioned were the Knicks, the Spurs, the Timberwolves, and the Heat. Um, the Spurs, the Timberwolves, and the Heat are, are, are each three very, very good teams, teams that appear to be on the rise. And they are each teams that, that could probably really use a scoring point guard in a big, big way. Um, you add Kyrie to any one of those three teams, and they and they suddenly become very very serious um, NBA championship contenders. Uh, so so those make sense. So then there's the Knicks, and there are some people yesterday who, when this news came out, they were like, Kyrie doesn't care about winning. Um, if he wants to go to the Knicks, he can't possibly care about winning because you know, the Knicks are a you know absolutely moribund franchise who, that have not um, performed well at all in, in recent years. Um, I actually think there's something here that people aren't recognizing. Kyrie Irving grew up in New Jersey, went to St. Patrick's High School just across the river from um, from New York City, uh, and um, I, I I think that Kyrie talks about the Knicks because my bet is his whole life he's wanted to play for the Knicks. That's you know that was probably his team growing up, and and so that it makes to me his trade request. You're talking about the Knicks, Spurs, Timberwolves, and Heat. Um, it makes perfect sense. It's either send me to the team that I've loved my whole life or send me to these three teams that could each use a point guard to make them great and take them over the top. Or just send um, me to the Kings because I don't have a say in the matter. Right. Yeah. <laughs> all of these are possibilities. These are all possibilities. Although, um, unlike his last contract when he was a restricted free agent, yes, he signed with Cleveland, but he was a restricted free agent, so he, could have, he couldn't have gone anyplace else, really. Um, in two years... Kyrie will be an unrestricted free agent. So if they send him to Sacramento and he doesn't like life in Sacramento, I mean, yeah, he's got to suck it up for a couple of years, but then he gets to pick his destination. He could always go to Detroit and play with Luke Kennard, and I'm going to transfer, segue that into Summer League. Luke Kennard, uh, Jason Tatum, um, were really dominant during Summer League. I didn't get a chance to see the Kings play, so I don't know how Harry Giles did. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, and I didn't really get to see a lot of um, uh, Frank Jackson with the Pelicans. I did see Omar, uh, I'm sorry, not Omar, uh, Quinn Cook um, with the uh, Summer League, and he was actually doing pretty decently. But Luke Kennard just really was a, a star for the Pistons during Summer League, averaging 17.2 points a game. He was really good from three-point land. Uh, and helping you know Detroit win a few games like single-handedly um, using him and uh, Henry Ellison. So I think that is really good to see for me. I'm a big Pistons fan, obviously, uh, but it's also good for Duke fans that he's you know basically came out the blocks firing. But Jason Tatum was so hot during summer league that it's you know Sports Center had I remember a couple of these games. Sports Center said, "Okay, guys, the Celtics won the summer league, but that's not what we're going to show you. We're just going to show you." Uh, Jason Tatum and all his points. And that was the highlight was just Jason Tatum scoring for a minute and 45 seconds. So that is the kind of like hoopla that has been around him. He's been doing really well. Um, You know, there was a lot of talk about who uh, would, who would go from the Celtics to make room for Gordon Hayward. Um, And Jason Tatum was one of those people that people like, well, I hope they don't trade him. I hope we didn't just get him for trade bait. And they, Obviously, love the kid because the guy was smoking hot during uh, summer league. Did you guys get a chance to see any of the games? I didn't get to see. Um, I didn't get to see Tatum in summer league, but I think that the the whole evolution of of the summer for him has been really interesting. We talked um, in the lost episode uh, about Jason Tatum and how the Celtics are an interesting fit for him because um, obviously they're already a contender, but. We weren't totally positive if he was going to start. Now we know that um, that they have Gordon Hayward coming in, who plays a similar position. You know, he's a he's also a big wing, um, which definitely hurt Tatum's chances of starting. Now Tatum balls out in summer league and is, you know, one of the one of the hottest commodities among the rookie class. So how could the Celtics possibly keep him on the bench? I think that watching his development this year and the way that he integrates with a team that, like you said, Donald doesn't really have doesn't have stars the way that the way that the the other you know best teams in the NBA do um, watching that I think is going to be really fascinating and and Jason Tatum 
um, has an opportunity, even on a crowded team, uh, to make a lot of noise because if if the Cavs start dismantling somehow, um, the Celtics all of a sudden could be the favorites in the East, um, and Jason Tatum could be playing deep into the playoffs. Yeah, and the the other thing is, you know, what really helps this and really helps like get people saying, "Oh, wow, that Jason Tatum guy is really good. That Luke Kennard guy is really, really good." Summer League really took off over the last couple of years. And this year, I feel like it was on TV. It was on ESPN at night. You know, we were seeing Lonzo Ball and, and the Lakers in Summer League. We were seeing Jason Tatum games before SportsCenter at, at like 5, 6 o'clock. So, you know, these games weren't just like on NBA TV where I would watch, you know, or the, or the most passionate of NBA fans would watch. It was on, you know, primetime viewing on ESPN ESPN two for people to watch. And I think that is kind of what's fed into this a little bit. Um, it's really ready to take off. And, and I think there's been more emphasis placed on summer league for some of these young stars as a chance for them to kind of get used to that limelight. I mean, you know, Lonzo ball and the Lakers were playing in front of sold out crowds in Vegas. Like that doesn't happen during summer league. They're usually played in practice gyms, uh, sometimes high school gyms that they can rent out in Orlando and, and in Vegas. So, that sort of thing, you know, the fact that with all eyes on them and the first chance for them to have some sort of pressure uh, and they're performing with these, uh, you know, with these kind of statistics, that's really good. That's really warming to see. Uh, Jason, what do you think? Well, so I was going to say, first of all, I saw a funny tweet the other day where someone said, everyone realizes that um, NBA Summer League has destroyed, has killed the WNBA, don't they? Uh, it, it used to be in the summertime, the only basketball you could see around here was mm-hmm. the WNBA. And I think everyone suddenly realized, oh, wait, there's NBA Summer League. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, it, it's getting better ratings and more. there's more conversation about Summer League than there is about the WNBA. I mean, not that that's a high hurdle to clear. <laughs> well, I, 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 that, I mean, that, that probably has, has evolved. I mean, it, it's really blown up the last couple of years. But as, as more and more of the NBA, young NBA players are – our younger guys are are one done guys. Um, these are this is more opportunities for people to see them um, that they maybe didn't get in their brief times in college. Yeah, well, and, and against better and better competition. I mean, not that although we should be very clear, NBA summer league competition is not you know legit NBA competition. It's it's better than college. I think the quality of the player is better than you get in an average college game, but. Um, it's not nearly what you get even in a even in an NBA D League game. Uh, uh, it's still guys who are very very young compared to NBA players, and and when you get guys who were even fringe rotation players in the NBA, you know guys who are like ninth or tenth man on their team when they play summer league, they 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 are among the best players in the league almost always. Uh, uh, last year. Um, you know, giving a Duke guy as an example, last year, Tyus Jones tore up the summer league. He was easily among the best players in the NBA summer league last year. And, and we saw this year, it didn't necessarily translate into a huge starring role for him in Minnesota. I mean, yeah, he was, uh, you know, he was either the, the number two or number three point guard for the most, most of the year. And he, he did perform well when he got chances. Um, but it, it's not like the fact that he tore up summer league meant that he was ready to become a star in the NBA, not by any stretch of the imagination. That said, as you guys pointed out, uh, Tatum and Kennard both looked great. And, and, you know, if you are the Celtics and the Pistons, this is what you wanted to see from them in a, in a very big way. Um, uh, the thing that really stood out, I think, about Tatum was the shots and the way he seemed to take difficult shots. He took the kind of shots that he's going to have to make in the NBA to be successful, and he was making them. Um, against guys who are at least the size and physical attributes of an NBA player. You know, these guys aren't undersized. They aren't, you know, poorer athletes. They're, they're very good athletes. So it, it really bodes well for his, for his future. Um, and, and Luke Kennard was filling it up as well. Luke Kennard shot really, really well from, from three-point range, um, although we've heard that what's going to matter for Luke Kennard is not going to be his scoring, not going to be his shooting. What's going to matter is if he can play defense. That's that's all that's all it's about in, in Detroit, right? Right, Donald? Yes, absolutely. And he, you know, for to his credit, you know, SVG Stan Van Gundy um, really commented on the fact that he has picked up his defense, and I think that is what is going to get him on the floor 
in Detroit. You know, it's it's kind of like Duke. You know, if you don't you can't play defense, you're not going to be on the floor. Um, and I think that the NBA type of defense obviously is a is a different d- different ball of wax. But he seems to be taking that on really well. Um, there was a couple times he had a few steals um, that were you know very NBA like steals. Um, I don't know how quite to describe them, but it was one of those things where he anticipated the pass, he saw it, and even with you know better athleticism on the floor, he was able to you know get in front between the man and the ball and and steal it for a lay in or, or for a three pointer. So that is what is going to keep him on the floor, and I think that is what the biggest turnaround in this game has been from Duke till now. Um, and I think that's what's, you know, really promising uh, in the eyes of the Pistons. Uh, so one of the other interesting things that happened in Summer League was Harry Giles, who didn't play. He, he, he didn't see the court at all in Summer League. Um, the Sacramento Kings are, are, are treating him with an abundance of caution. They, don't, they didn't want him to get out there and potentially hurt himself again. Um, and, and I think, you know... <laughs> You don't want to read too much into anything about Summer League because it's not the NBA. I mean, we just talked about that. Um, you know, Luke Kennard and Jason Tatum both average like 17 points a game. Let's, let's, not, let's not assume they're going to average 17 points a game in a regular NBA game. Um, and same with Harry Giles. You know, you don't want to read too much into Summer League stuff. But I think it is very telling that Sacramento is going to move very, very slowly with Harry Giles. Um, the fact that they didn't play him at all in summer league says to me that they are uh, they're they're probably not going to play him very much, if at all, in the NBA regular season. And unlike other guys who aren't who, young guys who aren't playing, I don't think they're going to send him down to their D League team all that much, um, because I think they want him to take the time to work on making his knees better and getting his explosiveness, getting his athleticism, um, getting that stuff back, the stuff that made him the top recruit in the land, and, and uh, many people thought, you know, one of the best NBA prospects in quite a while. Um, I just thought it was, you know, it's interesting to note that even though they took him with the first round pick, they're going to take their time, big time. I, you, may, you may find out that Harry Giles, Harry Giles may play in, you know, less than 10 games this entire year. I, I agree with that. Um, and honestly, I think that's what the, the pick was. It was more of a, you know, can, can his knees recover to the point where, you know, he's a, a solid NBA player. It's a big risk. Um, and, you know, we saw that with Duke that, you know, it just didn't come around as quickly as a lot of people expected it to. Um, but I think if we, you know, are able to, if they're able to let him develop and let him recover fully, heal fully, um, and he can play at an NBA level, that is a steal of the draft uh, if oh, we're yeah. looking five years from now. So oh, yeah. hopefully that is uh, the case. Let's wrap this up and, and move on quickly. Uh, you know, the non-conference schedule was released while we were uh, on hiatus, and we wanted to dive into that a little bit. There is um, obviously the trip to the Dominican Republic, which was announced earlier, uh, but now we have a full non-conference slate. The full slate of games, with including dates for the conference schedule, will come out at a later date. Usually it comes out around the 1st of uh, September, late August. But there is uh, something that we want to throw in to this. There's rumors that our first, in, our first ACC game would be against Boston College sometime in early December. I think on the 8th is what I heard. That would be one of the earliest games we've had in the ACC uh, in a long time. We usually don't start until right around the 1st of January or, or, the, or late December. But you know, having one in early December would be really interesting. It would be just that one. Um, game and then the rest of the schedule would be again in January. So let's dive into that and let's dive into the rest of this non-conference schedule. Sam, what do you take from the schedule? Uh, you know, last year we thought it was kind of a weaker schedule. What do you think about this year's? Still weak, um, and I especially feel bad for the uh, folks that have season tickets who think they might get to see one good team in Durham because um, unfortunately that's not happening this year. Um, the only marquee games that Duke is playing are against Michigan State in in uh, Chicago, um, at University of Indiana in Bloomington, and then in Portland for the, for the Phil Knight tournament over Thanksgiving. Um, so Duke fans in the, in the Midwest um, get to get to see a couple good games if they, if they choose to go. Um, but yeah, it's a shame that that there aren't great games in Durham, um, and 
uh, I don't remember it that off the top of my head who the home games are for um, ACC season, but um, you know, it's not like Duke doesn't have opportunities to challenge themselves. Indiana has a new head coach, but um, they're usually pretty competitive. Uh, the The games in Portland are the the one bummer here is that um, is that Duke has to play the first game against one of the hosts, Portland State. Um, so subtract one of the potentially competitive games for that. Um, I'm a little disappointed, but I think we say this every year. This is kind of the direction that college basketball goes. Um, if these teams don't get big money to play in big venues, they're not going to play other major programs. Oh, well. You know, I'll, I'll say one interesting thing about the, the schedule. Um, we, are, we are back to having a non-conference game in the midst of the ACC season. Uh, I think for a couple of years now, um, just the nature of the way the ACC put their schedule together, Duke was Duke didn't have a non-conference game in like, you know, you know, at once we got done with, uh, with December essentially. Um, you know, we played nothing but conference games throughout January and February and March. Um, and and we the the new schedule uh, brings us back to having a non-conference opponent. We will we will play St. John's um, in New York on Saturday, February third. And I'm I'm excited for that. I think it's always nice to get to go out of conference, um, you know, in the midst of that huge conference schedule, you know, to sort of test yourself against a team that that you aren't seeing, uh, you know, constantly uh, every every single year. Um, I think that's you know that's always interesting. Um, I sort of wish it was someone other than St. John's. I mean, St. John's is a historically a great great um, college basketball program. And uh, you know, the, you, you can tick off a list of some really great players who played for St. John's. That hasn't been the case in recent years, uh, and their their program has been down. I haven't really looked to see if they're, you know, going to be much better this year. But I mean, St. John's doesn't even really make the tournament anymore. They don't even really make the NIT anymore, do they? I don't think so. I mean, they're, they're yeah. just, they just had a down couple years where I mean. They're just not really on the map, and I think uh, you know, who is it? Chris Mullen is the coach now. Um, yeah, I was gonna say it's kind of cool that Chris Mullen is is coaching there, but he yeah, hasn't started... he's trying to get that back. But it's gonna take a while for them to do that. They need to get the recruiting back that they used to kind of have back in the old days. I mean, Chris Mullen doesn't yeah. even resonate uh, with me as a as an exciting former basketball player, and I'm ten years older than kids entering college now. That's true. Really? Yeah, I don't I don't remember well, Chris on. Mullen. Really, sorry. Run TMC. Um, guys fade. Guys fade quickly from from public consciousness. I mean, St. John's was fourteen and nineteen last year. Yeah, that's bad. They're just they're not that good. Well, I mean, it's also it's New York City. They used to ha- like pride themselves on the fact that they were New York City's basketball team. They you know played all these games in the Garden. They were in the Big East. They were you know dominant. Donald, um, Donald, times have changed. Syracuse is New York's college team. Just look at their branding. Yeah, yeah, that's what I hear. But I mean, just that fact that they, you know, if they can't get a blip on the radar in New York City, they they go into the nether regions, and they it's hard for the for them to come back from that. So I think that's kind of what St. John's problem is. They need to win. They need to get some back on the radar of some of those city recruits um, to kind of get back to the prominence that they used to have. So Sam, by the way, you know, you mentioned the fact that that Duke doesn't really have. Um, uh, the non-conference schedule doesn't include any interesting games in Cameron, um, and and that's been the case in recent years. You know, a lot of the problem with that, a lot of the reason for that is, uh, you know, by definition, an interesting game is going to be against another team that is competitive. You know, a, a top twenty-five or or at least a you know a top thirty or top forty kind of team, and and teams like that do not want to come play in Cameron Indoor Stadium. Mm-hmm. You know, basically, yeah, the only reason you come play in Cameron is if the ACC forces you to. Or you know, or if you're getting a, a huge payday that's going to help your program to make its budget. Um, uh, you, other teams, you know, uh, power conference teams, they're just not going to come play in Durham. They're not going to come play in Cameron. Oh, I, I, so, I, I, I know it's the case. It, it's just a shame. Yeah, yeah I agree. No, I agree it's... with you. But on the other hand, it's kind of fun watching us beat the snot out of Furman and Southern and and Elon and Utah yeah, but Valley. It, but it means, but it yeah. means that when we do these preview shows, we have to. We have to like go find tape and stats and stuff on these programs, and it's just harder on us. <laughs> I want I want the people to pity us. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. I, I I actually think for this coming season, 
when we have opponents like that, I mean, maybe you do a little tiny bit of research, but well, you don't need to be watching any tape. There's just, it's just not guys, worth this, it. There's no reason. Here, here's hey, the thing. These guys still record on tape. Like that's what we're dealing with. Some of these guys you know actually have gonna, camcorder tape. We're gonna feel we're gonna feel so terrible when Duke loses two of these games this year, because um, this is all on our bad juju. So let's uh let, let let's cut this off before we before we really spite ourselves. <laughs> Let's go to parting shots. I'll start with you, Jason. Do you have a parting shot? I got nothing. Okay. Sam, do you have one? <laughs> I, learned, I learned this morning that Jim Beheim has a son who's currently a college basketball recruit. And, uh, and he's tearing that's it just, up. Yeah. And uh, I just didn't know that that was, that that was a thing. Um, Jim Beheim's like 100 years old. So, um, you know, power to you. Uh, my That's parting shot is, oh, wait, 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 you know, the cool thing about, uh, I think his name is Cody, Cody Beheim or something like that. Anyway, okay. the cool, <laughs> the cool thing about Beheim's son is everyone just assumed that he was going to go to Syracuse automatically, that he wasn't, I mean, he was sort of a so-so recruit. Um, and then he played really well on the, on the, the, the spring and summer circuit. Um, and, and now he's getting offers from other schools, including Gonzaga just offered him. Um, and, and schools think that there may be a chance that they could pry him away from Syracuse. Although I just I mean, think it's sort of how, crazy. How could you leave, how could you leave uh, Winters in Syracuse being yelled at by Jim Beheim? True. And that's, that, that's, <laughs> that's every kid's dream, especially if he grew up in that house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, my parting shot is basketball related. It's back to the NBA. This year um, is the year that the NBA switches uh, their apparel from, uh, from Adidas to Nike. And coming with that, Nike is now starting to release uh, in the next couple of weeks, months, we don't know. Um, before the season, they're going to be releasing not one, not two, not three, but four new jerseys for every single NBA team. What every yeah. NBA team is going to be able to do for the first time ever is select one of those four to be their primary home jersey for the year. It does not have to be the home white jersey or, in the case of the Lakers, uh, the gold uh, jersey. It can be any of those four jerseys that they have in their collection for this year. Um, some teams are also getting a fifth jersey, um, probably for Christmas or for some other heritage collection of something of some sort. But I think this is a cool thing that teams are going to be able to kind of form an identity behind these new jerseys. And I think that's what Nike is trying to get them to do. Uh, and, but what's going to happen is for the first few games of the NBA season, it means that people are going to have to kind of really focus in on the courts and the fans and all that stuff to see where they're actually playing. Because, you know, it used to be you can turn on the TV, you could see a team wearing uh, the white shirts and they would be the home team. Now it's a collection of, you know, third jerseys and and heritage nights and uh, Christmas jerseys. And we kind of have to focus in on that. This year, they're going to have one jersey that they're going to wear, but it can be any of the four from that collection. Now, what are the four going to be? We don't know. There's going to be a, a white home jersey, quote unquote. There's going to be a road jersey that's in the primary team colors. And then there's going to be two more that the teams get to kind of pick out. What does this mean for the Pistons? Hopefully, it means the return of a red jersey uh, and no teal because we hate the teal. But I think just for the standpoint of fandom, like it's always cool to kind of see what teams are thinking about to kind of create an identity with their fans. You see this in hockey, you see it in soccer a lot as well, and you see it in the NFL. Now the NBA is going to get their turn, and I think that's brilliant. I think it's brilliant marketing. I think it's going to be really cool to see how these uh, teams make their picks over the next couple of weeks and months. If somebody wants to send me dope, uh, now very underpriced uh, Washington Wizards apparel, I'd take it. Right. <laughs> I, will, I will check the clearance racks here at Ross. Uh, next time I'm I appreciate there. that though. for you. Thanks. I, I will regarding the jerseys and, and the multiple jerseys and such, I will merely say that I sort of enjoy being able to glance at a game and immediately know who's playing based on the colors and the jersey style. Mm -hmm. And well the guys in the box are about to be wearing antlers, so it's gonna be very easy. Correct. <laughs> like just not like he's not kidding, just straight up antlers. Just like on their heads. Yeah. When you, get to, when you get to four different jersey styles, that becomes more difficult. That's true. Don't be so old, Jason. And that's where we'll leave one. it. <laughs> <laughs>
And you know what? That's going to do it for episode 79 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. We will be back very soon. We promise. Football season's coming, and we're going to do previews. We're going to start getting into that. We're going to talk about the uh, trip to the Dominican Republic for the basketball team when that comes about. But for now, stay tuned to the DBR forums. For Jason, for Sam, I am Donald. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and Duke Band, take us out.